Greatness is found in pure hearts that love Jesus Christ. Hard to believe, but we are wrapping up the last and final question of 18 questions to determine if this is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Uh, I know that it's been uh, a long study. It's been very good for me, and I hope that it's been good for you. If you're wondering where we're going to go uh, with tips, next week we'll have another Bible study video clip and then uh, making an announcement then as to the direction that we're going to be going. So with all of that said, Galatians chapter 5, uh, reading in verse number 22, and I'll remind you there are nine fruits here. There are three categories of fruits, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, that's God word, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, that's man word, and then the final three that we've been looking at, which is the inward condition, faith or faithful, full of faith, meekness, temperance, meekness is that unique characteristic that we only seem to find in Christ, and is a unique characteristic for the believer if it's found in us today. We look around the world and, and certainly meekness isn't valued. And so we move from meekness to temperance. Before I describe temperance, read the last phrase, because I think that there's a, a unique connection to the last word in the last phrase. Against such there is no law. So you have to take Galatians 5, uh, 23, against such there is no law, and the fruits of the Spirit in the context of the entire book. In Galatians chapter 2, he talks about how um, the Galatian believers have began to forsake the gospel. And in chapter 3, um, he tells them that they have forsaken Christ in the process of growing closer to God. In other words, um, he actually uses the word in Galatians chapter 3, you can read it for yourself, he actually uses the word bewitched. Really strong word. And then he... Um, he accuses them of denying the very reason that Jesus died on the cross as though they didn't believe that Jesus died on the cross. Um, because if, if you don't understand or believe the reason why Christ died on the cross, that it might as well be that he never died on the cross. So why did Christ die on the cross to bring grace into our lives? And what is grace? A friendship with God that I don't deserve. And so an unbeliever that is accepting Christ understands the role that grace plays but uh, how amazing it is that believers often forget that the only way that we have favor with God is because he chooses to love us and because of what Jesus did for us, not because we have somehow figured it out and become good enough to impress God. And so if we submit to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will develop us. And we can't put a set of rules. We can't say there are nine rules that if you will follow, you will make the fruit of Christianity. Instead, the Apostle Paul comes along and says, this is the product of a deep friendship with the Holy Spirit, where you learn to listen to the Holy Spirit, submit to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, and then God the Father will, through the Son and the counseling of the Spirit, produce these awesome characteristics in you. Often we want to be good Christians without ever being good friends to God, and it just doesn't work that way. And so the fruits of the Spirit, the, the Spirit living inside of me, the symbiotic relationship that I can have with the Holy Spirit uh, will produce these characteristics. And so what is the last phrase, temperance? Which, by the way, if you're, if you're not familiar, the word temperance literally means self-control. You say, what does self-control have to do with against such there is no law? Well, ironically, we would try to control ourselves into producing this fruit. But Paul says you can't produce this fruit by making yourself produce it. It's something that has to happen between you and the Holy Spirit. And yet he emphasizes the importance. You can't just abandon self-control. And I think when, when we start preaching grace, uh, sometimes um, preachers and teachers are afraid to preach grace for fear of what's going to happen with people. And that is, as the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. That is immediately what people do. Uh, after 13 years of pastoring, I have watched that, that the moment you tell somebody, I don't have a rule for that, they don't look to do what is the most I can do for Jesus. Make me do something for Jesus. 
And Paul comes along and says it doesn't work that way. And so uh, rather than, than, than doing whatever it is that I want to do, realize the role that self-control plays. The Apostle Paul actually describes it in Romans chapter 7. I was texting with one of you this week. You were sharing with me something that you had read by, I believe it was David Jeremiah. Uh, one of our church family was texting me, and he was talking about the, the inward condition, that there's two natures that are in us. And uh, you could look at it as the role of the Holy Spirit and the role of flesh, or as the new man and the old man, the way that Paul describes it in the book of Ephesians. This is the way he describes it in Romans chapter 7. Um, what shall we say in verse 7? Romans 7, 7. What shall we say is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. And just to kind of back you up, um, in the first seven verses, the Apostle Paul says that the law is never going to fix anybody. That's the role of the Holy Spirit's ministry. But we can't give laws to fix people. We tried that and it didn't work. That's why Christ came to gift us a new nature and give us the Holy Spirit. Because in our flesh, we will never be able to please Christ. We will never do what God wants. And so what shall we say then about law? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. He says the same thing in Galatians chapter 4, that the purpose of the law is like a teacher, which brings me to Christ. The law shows me that I am lost. And the law shows me that I am incapable of righteousness. Uh, if you think that you're good, try and follow the law and you'll find your need for Christ. In verse 8, he says, But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be to death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death to me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So the law never makes a man righteous, because all the law does is reveal sin, and sin is always present in a live human being. Did you hear me? Sin is always present in a live human being. John talks about this in 1 John chapter 1. He says, my little children. And in chapter 2, verse 1, if we sin, in verse 1, or in chapter 1, he says that if we say that we don't sin, then we're liars and the truth isn't in us. To be alive means that we're going to sin and the law will always reveal our sin. That's what it does. And so then he says, so then does it look, it's starting to look like all the law is is sin. Is that what it is? And he says, no, it's not. It's me. But the law shows who I really am. He says in verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. I I'm doing stuff I never gave myself permission to do. For what I would or the things that I desire to do, that I do not. Or, or I don't do those things that I wish I was doing. But what I hate, I do. Have you ever caught yourself? perpetuating sin that you can't stand. I don't think anyone gets up in the morning, looks at themselves in the mirror and says, I think I'll be the meanest person I've ever met. And yet, isn't it incredible that we will sometimes project some of the people that were worse to us in our own lives? If I then do that, which is, if I do then, if I then, <laughs> if then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And so we can't just simply say, well, I did it, but I didn't want to do it. And so I didn't actually do it. The law comes along and says, no, you did it. In other words, ignorance is no defense. Or I desire to do something differently. And so that must count for something. And Paul says, no, it doesn't count for anything. What you do is the only thing that counts. For I know that in me dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Even when I want to do right, I just can't figure out how to do it. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So I want to do right, and I can't. And yet I find myself doing evil, which I never wanted to do in the first place. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I love God's word. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. There's, 
there is a secret agent that's working and destroying my heartbeat, which is to love and honor God. And he gives us that secret agent in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Did you hear that? With the mind, I serve the law of God. And with the flesh, with my feelings, with my impulses, with my nature, I serve the law of sin. And so here, through the gift of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul acknowledges that it's the Holy Spirit's teaching through my mind. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. The Holy Spirit wants to access our relationship with God through our understanding of who God is. And so I read his word and it's the voice of the Holy Spirit and it's the heart of the Holy Spirit who has written these words. And as I read them, he reveals God to me. He also shows me my failures and he shows me what God deserves. And he gives me motivation through the death of Jesus on the cross to actually give God what he deserves. And so it's all the friendship, relationship, submission of the Holy Spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit is in us, leading us and controlling us, then the wretched man of sin will be defeated and the, the image of Christ will succeed. Uh, but if I don't follow the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it is guaranteed that I'll be doing all kinds of things that I said in the first place I would never want to do. And that is an absolute guarantee. There is no man that is above falling when he turns his back on the Holy Spirit. And so we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And how do we have the Holy Spirit in our lives? Well, understand this. The greatest enemy to the Holy Spirit in your life is you. I know you would think it would be Satan or the world's philosophy, but the greatest enemy to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your personal life is you. And the way in which the Holy Spirit is accessed is by dying to yourself and living to the Holy Spirit. And so self-control becomes the key by which we say the Holy Spirit gets to do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. If I'm going to submit, it means I'm going to have to put the wretched man in his place. And every one of us has that wretched man or the old sin nature still living in us. The Apostle Paul talks about being excited for the perfecting. That's why uh, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if I die, I get to gain. If I live, I'm going to live out Christ. And Christ gets pleased by the way in which I live. But the gain that he's talking about is the wretched man is going to be put to death once and for all. When we die and go to heaven, that's it. The wretched man dies, but the new creature that is in Christ cannot be killed because Christ already died on the cross and rose again for us. And so the new man in Christ gets to continue to live on. And the way that we access that new man now is through self-control. Think about it. When Jesus started his ministry, there were several different things that happened. There really were, there were three things that happened as he started his ministry, four if you include the calling of the disciples. But there were three things that happened. Remember when Mary came to Jesus and asked him to, um, to do a miracle because they were out of wine at the wedding feast? And what did he say? My time has not yet come. There are things that I want to do before I start my ministry, and I haven't done those things yet. And so this can't be the start of my ministry. And so um, it's, it's, as far as we know, the only... The only uh, uh, miracle that he performed, what he said, was outside of his actual three-year ministry on his way to the cross. Uh, it's the only one that we have recorded. Um, but there are several things that happened. Um, first, he, uh, or one of them was that he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came in. Another, that he was tempted of Satan. But before he was tempted of Satan, what happened? For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted. Why would Jesus fast in preparation for his ministry? Because the things in which he was going to do, he absolutely needed to have the Holy Spirit's control in his life. And that would never happen if he was not able to control himself, to be disciplined. If you're in the habit of following all of your impulses and all of your feelings, then know that that's not the Holy Spirit working in your life. All too often, we attribute our feelings to the Holy Spirit. We say, let's it's how I feel. <laughs> uh, if, if what you're doing is what you feel instead of right, 
then know this, that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. And there is our 18th question. Does this cause me to do what is right or to do what I feel like? And so self-control becomes a critical characteristic in the life of somebody that wants a good relationship with the Holy Spirit because you are the greatest enemy to the Holy Spirit in your life. Father, thank you for this study and for helping us to understand how much you love us and for us to be willing to acknowledge that there is so much that we do that is contrary to you. We automatically assume because you love us and you're good to us, we must be doing everything right. But as we dive into your word, we find out that you're just that good, uh, that we rarely are doing what's right. And our flesh never wants to do what's right. Um, but because of your saving work and the Holy Spirit's work, if we will submit, you will transform us to be like Jesus. How awesome to see that the master creator of the universe functions with self-control. How humbling to know that we should as well. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.